So my name is Georgios Taktis. I am originally Greek. I've lived in a number of uh, European countries. I'm now based in uh, the Netherlands. I live in Amsterdam and um, I have been teaching philosophy at different universities. At the moment, I'm, I'm mostly doing research. I'm doing a postdoctoral project in uh, the philosophy of technology. And I'm particularly also interested in um, ecology. Uh, and um, so my kind of relation to um, this has grown out of a broader interest on uh, the inorganic, uh, on matter, and so on, which is a very important philosophical category. And as we were discussing with Hester a little while ago, um, I mean, I just comp finished an essay uh, on um, with the title Mineral Freedom. And um, the question is whether I continue with this project and develop it into a, a book link project. It is possible. And um, so I have an ongoing interest on the question of um, the mineral, so to say. So uh, maybe Hester, you would like to also introduce yourself Yes, hi. Um, I'm an artist. I'm, I've sort of practiced in a very expanded sense, but then in a, also a very intensely art with a capital A sense as well. Um, expanded by that, I mean, I think larger questions of um, reality and just what it means to be in existence or what it unmeans to be in existence have kind of goaded everything I've done, probably why I became an artist. Um, and intensely with a capital A, because I have become intensely fascinated by what I would call artistic operations. So for me, that's through making, but it's also through thinking rather than thought. Um, I've done a lot of live art. I'm really interested in the repercussions of our thinking and being in the world on actions, less theatre performance, that has its place, but I'm not so interested in that. I'm more interested in the raw beingness of a human being and taking place as an event in the world, in my life, in the lives of others. Um, so live art has been important, but so's the image. The image is important and I find writing hard, but it's of course essential. Um, I'll also say I've got a master's in philosophy. I'm not a philosopher, but I couldn't do what I do without the engagement with certain philosophy and also certain philosophers like Georgius. At the face of it, uh, one might wonder, OK, why the mineral and, and what is mineral aesthetics? Right. So uh, what is the, the connection there? Uh, it will hopefully become very soon uh, apparent. Um, but uh, the first thing to say is that we understand aesthetics um, kind of much more than the the theory of the beautiful or the theory of the sublime in the classical formulations in the history of aesthetics, um, but uh, also with a kind of much more broader um, a notion of aesthesis of, of the uh, experience of the world. So um, the way we encounter the world is, um, is fundamental here. And um, obviously we encounter the world uh, in its kind of solidity, in its stability, and um, in its kind of articulation. Um, yes, hello, Martin. We we so so just to conclude this thing. So we uh, aesthetics is um, is is for us uh, a, a much broader um, domain. Uh, for example, including. Um, you know, for example, Ranciere and the regime of the visible. Um, so, um, and going on to Martin, uh, yes, you're in Nitra, Slovakia. Okay, yes, yes, and uh, we we better get going because time is is very precious indeed. So let's 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 make a start. Let's. So I I had the idea of premising this talk around Kailua's. Um, work i don't know whether again you've you've read it or you know who kailua was so um he's a figure that nowadays he's very obscure in anglophone countries he's hardly known his work is relatively little translated 
Um, but if one digs into this uh, discussion um, of, of stones, uh, sooner or later one kind of chances upon him. Uh, he was an, an interesting uh, figure, uh, um, uh, very diverse. Uh, he was a poet. He was mainly perhaps known as a sociologist. Um, he uh, was an editor. Um, and he was also connected to uh, the early uh, surrealists. And I will mm, give you a story from that in a second. Um, but... Uh, among the many other things he did, he also collected uh, stones. He collected uh, rare um, um, pieces um, at a time when actually there was relatively little interest in them. And his private collection is now um, a house in Paris. Uh, it has become a public uh, property. So um, he it, it is extraordinary to see this kind of... Um, his fascination with with those objects, and I think uh, in a in a bit when I uh, go through, maybe maybe Hester will show some of the images right in the book if you have it there, or or no, no or, sadly I don't. I couldn't get hold yeah. of a copy of the book. I I hadn't realized yeah. how rare it's okay. a gem. This book is a gem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it both is. Writing it is. and images, and I hadn't realized therefore how rare it was. I wanted yeah. to hold up the images, but um, but no worries. Uh, no worries. I uh, it, it is fine. Uh, I I might uh, pull up some images myself in in a minute while uh, we're sure, having. Let, let me that yes, while yes. You... exactly. Yeah. So so um, um, so Kailois had this wonderful collection. Uh, as a sociologist, he did uh, very important work on uh, the notion of play, together with the Dutch Johan Huizinga. Uh, they were the pioneers of this kind of notion within this anthropological, sociological uh, context um, that influenced obviously a lot of philosophy like Derrida and so on. Um, but he also had this, as I, I, I underline, avid interest in, in, in stones that has had a profound in influence on later geologists and, and jewel makers and artists and so on. And one of the few things that is translated in it is it's very hard to get uh, by book I, by uh, by him called The Writing of Stones, uh, which thankfully, however, is easily available online. And um, um, I have chosen um, two sets of uh, quotes from it to get us going, just to give you an impression of, of, of what interests him and, and where we're coming from. Um, but it is, of course, worth reading in its entirety. So the first thing uh, is that um, Kailua is interested in, in those stones that are rather unique. They're not necessarily um, precious They're in the sense of having a, a, a monetary value like diamonds and other types of gems, emeralds and so on. But they have uh, something that is special about them. And that has often to do with certain forms that the, the 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 stones display so uh to give you an example and again you see how um he was uh yeah so this is the famous one one of the most most intriguing examples this is called the castle and uh you can see the tiny little figures for example on there with uh, with the ferns and so on it is hard to believe that this is not made by a human that this is a natural formation and in fact, it is. I think. I think it, there is still a debate as to um, exactly whether whether this is in fact a natural formation. But uh, Calois is uh, is confident enough to include it in his book. Um, so let me let me read a few passages to uh, show you how he evocatively kind of connects to to those forms. He writes, for example, early in the book, an agate may shadow. Forth a tree, several trees, groves, a forest, a whole landscape. A piece of marble can suggest a river flowing among hills. The clouds and lightning flashes of a storm, thunderbolts and the grandiose plumes of frost. A hero fighting a dragon or a great sea full of fleeing galleys, like the scene the Roman saw reflected in the eyes of the eastern queen already planning to betray him. So all those things can be a, a part of, uh, you know, what uh, a stone uh, 
kind of depicts. And then he writes about some Oregon jaspers, about a uh, very different, very different type of uh, impressions generated there. He talks about a mauve and lunatic life, proliferating without law or limit, feverishly breeding tumors and goiters, a ravenous, shifting universe in which details are so clear it is almost endless. Wounded flesh shows how this monstrous realm works, idly limbed by imperturbable stone, which neither feels nor knows. By the way, this is uh, one that he actually had framed himself, um, uh, and he um, compared it to um, um, Duchamp's nude descending staircase. So for him, this is like uh, nature doing Duchamp before Duchamp, kind of uh, already made in that way. And um, uh, so, so um, and, and then finally, a, a last passage, which again shows this kind of richness of forms that one can observe in stones. And, and there are countless of those passages in, in his work. Um, but uh, just to round it out here, the same markings could just as well be identified as in the onyxes as the downstrokes and upstrokes of some elaborate calligraphy or a su subtle semblance of writing invented by some mad scribe in love with shape, but above meaning. So um, there is one famous uh, uh, stone that actually looks very much like Arabic writing. Um, and um, I don't think I can find it, but carry on. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's, that's great. Uh, this is also a very uh, interesting landscape. And here you can see the type of stone that um, he uh, talks about in the Renaissance, especially in Italy. It was very common to take those landscape uh, forms and supplement them, so to say, with um, painted uh, forms. And so there is this hybrid between uh, natural form and, 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 and human artistic creation. Now, um, the the what what kind of i think is the this is actually maybe comes close to that type of 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 writing yes uh what is interesting is uh, from from a philosophical point of view i think is the uh fine line um between so the idea that a sign um can express meaning um, is is obviously deeply in, ingrained in us, uh, but we often believe that the condition for that is human intention, human intentionality. Right? the 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 question of um, the, the 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 kind of haunts uh, Kailua is okay. What do we make out of those forms that nature makes? So, for example, what if nature kind of shapes the figure of a human face? Uh, millions of years before humans as a species like Homo sapiens is even on the face of Earth, right? Um, what is that? Um, I'll give you now three passages that um, talk a little bit about, um, about that kind of uh, haunting kind of sense and, and what kind of it means for, for, for Kailua. So, um, for a stone represents an obvious achievement, he writes, yet one arrived without in in invention, skill, industry, or anything else that would make it a work in the human sense of, a of the word, much less a work of art. The work comes later, as does art. But the far, far off roots and hidden models of both lie in the obscure yet irresistible suggestions in nature. Um, and then again, he writes, each stone as unique and irreplaceable as a work of genius is as valuable at once pointless and priceless, pointless and priceless. And finally, uh, I see the origin. And I think this is really um, a passage that sums up his best intuition on that. Um, uh, he uh, he writes, I see the origin of the irresistible attraction of metaphor and analogy 
the explanation of our strange and permanent need to find similarities in things. I can scarcely refrain from suspecting some ancient diffuse magnetism, a call from the center of things, a dim, almost lost memory, or perhaps a presentiment, like a presentiment, pointless in so puny a being of a universal syntax. So what Pailua is saying is that, in a way, nature is kind of offering that, that syntax is the word here, of forms. It actually gives the, 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 the spectrum and scope of form mobility, let's say, of, of, of the capacity to form. And it is because it is because this possibility is already there, written in stone literally, that other later forms can 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 kind of assume uh, those possibilities. Um, and effectively also weave this web of of analogies of science because of course it's not just humans who use science and here i think is one uh moment to transition into you know my interest in this because there is uh, i don't know whether you know or not uh a, a lot of work on on biosymiosis which effectively means the ways in which um kind of other non-human life uh creates science and communicates and um there's fascinating work done on all levels you know a lot of that especially in the humanities about 10 to 20 years ago was focused around humans so around animals but um since then there's there's been a lot of work on plants and uh, other kingdoms of life um and so we know that um other animals do produce signs and uh, what we mean what we make of that theoretically is, is i think very interesting in itself but very often the discussion starts stops at the threshold of life so there is a point where you know uh, you enter life and then signs become possible and for me the interesting question is you know uh, w what is that limit and what happens below it um what about the kind of um, creation of 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 signs uh, without effectively this model or outside this model of um, uh, kind of preservation of um, environmental adaptation that an animal um, plays into, and again this has to do with aesthesis at the most fundamental level because it has to do with the way that any life uh, perceives and receives the world around it so um yeah i i think i think um you see you start kind of getting a glimpse of um kind of the, the significance of, of of this so now we have um we have already kind of reached a little bit above 12 o'clock and um i don't want maybe it's better to to reserve a, a further elaboration for the discussion so that i don't i don't go too far uh, but you see that my interest uh, just to underline that one more time has to do with the um kind of conditions of meaning uh what uh, from jacques luc nancy um, I, one understands as a sense in, in French sense, right? So the the kind of orientation also in the world, uh, because sense means orientation in French, literally. So the, the way we orient ourselves uh, and, um, and, and, and so also kind of create meaning. Um, for me, there is something that kind of bridges the meaningful and the meaningless and that is what um points uh, like or kailua's work points to 
And if we were to kind of layer it with a very traditional other uh, approach within the history of aesthetics, such as, for example, Hegel's, right? So for Hegel, um, there is no... So Hegel, for one thing, moves away from aesthetics in the because he says, well, okay, there is beauty, the beautiful in nature, there is a sublime in nature, but this does not concern the history of spirit, which imbues uh, works with meaning. And he says, I'm interested in the development of spirit, so I'm going to focus exclusively on human works. Um, and so if you read Hegel's aesthetics, it's all about human creations, you know, from architecture to poetry, um, because this is the domain of the spirit. And um, and I think, you know, working in the 21st century, obviously, this is not um, satisfactory anymore. Um, and with that, I give it over to, to Hester, and we'll come back to those issues. I'm going to share some images and just say a few things in relationship to them. Just bear with me while I, while I share screen. I'm going to talk about two um, artistic operations. Um, and they both involve a rock that's become very important to some of these artistic operations. I hope I'm not instrumentized seeing the rock it might sound like I am but actually the rock I'm trying to use the rock to be a rock to enable a kind of what I call a liberational maneuver which I know is a mouthful but the way humans can reorientate themselves together in a creative and meaningful yet playful manner so I won't say too much about the events because I want to try and focus just bring a resonance of the rock and how I'm interacting or not interacting with the rock within human gatherings. And uh, I think Georgius might have already um, said this quote, but I, I wanted just to repeat it because um, as an artist, who is absolutely obsessed with making. Um, I'm also really humbled before, I suppose, the fact that there is something here to be working with. Georges put it really beautiful when he talked about um, the way nature holds a universal syntax. Um, that, And for me, um, rocks and stones in particular because they're everywhere and so mundane they are also extraordinary in the way they confront us with that it's kind of mind-bending and very hard to put into words um so for us he Calois says for a stone represents an obvious achievement yet one arrived at without invention skill industry or anything else that would make it a work in the human sense of the word much less a work of art and yet, <laughs> how profound a rock or stone is purely on that account. Oh, why won't my page move? Give me one second. There we go. Um, this is the rock. It's grit. And it's, I live in Yorkshire in England. It's been plucked from the landscape. This is in the gallery of the Art Education Archives. And when I do the 24 hour Origin of the Work of Art, which I've done many times with students, I always do it in a gallery, but I shut the doors. It's a private event to allow a different community to develop over a period of 24 hours. And although I'm a lecturer with my students, um, I see the rock as the main instructor, as the key agency in the room. And I suppose by putting these events in galleries, I'm hoping to question or to provoke 
just what constitutes art, just what are the problems of culture that might, and aesthetics as they're more prosaically known or traditionally known, that I feel get in the way of receiving the gift of isness, ironically gets in the way, and yet also is maybe one of the potential experimental, playful, open spaces where both philosophy and art can come together, um, albeit in possibly eccentric ways, to open that space up. And um, as the title suggests, I use this as a way to try and teach Martin Heidegger's The Origin of the Work of Art. And I find that essay a liberational manoeuvre in its own right. There is something that is stretched and opened up, but of course impossible to teach. Um, on the left, you can see Heidegger's book um, of his work, Heidegger Among the Sculptures, and I've, I've put it in the podium. Other than that, we have no artworks in the rooms. There's always a small black magnet on top of the rock whenever I use it in a work. I call this the otherwise molecule. And it's usually kept in my mouth until any of the event starts. And if I don't speak, it stays in my mouth. In the 24 hour Origin the Work of Art lecture event, it's an event, it's a performative event, a collaboration with students, it's not scripted. I, I start with us at the rock and then I never ever allude to the rock afterwards, but I take the molecule out of my mouth and put it on the stone. Um, it's hard to explain, <laughs> but I'm trying to suggest a different way of being. That's not us being subjects talking about an object. And Heidegger talks about the festival and I see these as a contemporary evocation of the holy day and the festival, but without any direct reference to any specific, you know, obviously supernatural entity, and certainly not as a throwback to the ancient Greeks. So my hope is, as we do our things that we do, which includes eating, chatting, getting bored, me giving lectures, that the rock's presence takes place without me asking it. It's, it's a strange kind of uh, releasement in Heidegger's sense, I suppose. Uh, so um, we took a video of the last time we did one, which was just before lockdown. And I've just taken some screenshots that mainly show the rock over the day rather than the event. It's always evocative to me and possibly my students don't pick it up, but then I hope it goes in them through the back of their heads that as we prepare food, talk, make notes, laugh, eat, sometimes play games, that the rock seemingly does nothing. Of course, only seemingly. And there are strange sculptural blankets attached to canvases on the left and I'll speak about those in a minute.
we obviously sleep there too. I'm I, I'm not cruel when I say I lock everyone in for 24 hours. I find this quote by Martin Heidegger from The Thing very relevant to how I um, bring the rock into artistic operation or apply artistic operation to allowing the rock into some <sighs> at least in a way to shatter something to shatter our cultural restrictions so he says when and in what way do things appear as things they do not appear by means of human making but neither do they appear without the vigilance of mortals. The first step towards such vigilance is the step back from the thinking that merely represents, that is, explains, to the thinking that responds and recalls. And I suppose for me that's the thinking, whether it's artistic, making, acting or philosophical thinking that I'm interested in. There's a ritualistic element always to working with the stone that I think is important. And in the 24 hour origin work of art lectures, there is an alarm clock that goes off on the hour, every hour until we sleep. And when the alarm clock goes off, we have to stop whatever it is we're doing and we have to disappear ourselves. And it's to try and one, create a different sense of time and unfolding in the way we are together. But it's also a way of acknowledging the stone's presence without objectifying it. Heidegger says that only humans have a world and that a stone has a throng. And at this point, I'm trying to enable us to become throng to the stone. Um, every time I do it, there's a different way of becoming invisible. Um, this year, we use sculpture blankets and canvases. And we stay disappearing for seven minutes. And the use of painting canvases is something I use a lot as well. Um, but I quite like the canvas bare because it comes back to clean slate or an aesthetics of existence for me. And then just to end, it take, I think I have time. It would take a minute, Georgia. Yes, I'm just going to read. Is that a fine with you timing wise? Yeah, we have now five minutes left. I don't know. Maybe we can stress uh, another couple of minutes over. Oh, I thought we were ending in 15 minutes. Have I got the wrong timing? Because if not, I don't have to, I don't have to read that section. It's fine. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, it... Uh, it's all right, you know, five, five, ten minutes, because we're going to have a presentation by Martin uh, later on, which is pre-recorded and then a lunch break. So don't stress out if you need extra seven, well, ten you know, issues. Okay. I just want to make sure there's a chance for Q&A. That's all. Yeah, I yeah. don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll work it out. Okay. It's not um, an academic conference, so. Okay. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly that I got invited because of these 24 hour origin, the work of art things I did. Um, I got invited to present at a conference called From Heidegger to Performance, which of course was very exciting for me, but then it became another problem. What does that mean? 
to perform in a Heideggerian sense. And for me, that takes us back to the performance of sense, the allowing of sense, um, which means I can't stand on a theatre as an actress or actor. That That's not the point. Um, again, it comes back to the performance of a liberational manoeuvre and a crediting of the fact that there is something else performing and active, even if it's not in life, and it's certainly not human, that is first before anything else. And that's the kind of threshold as an artist and a thinker I'm always wanting to try and evoke, but not just through words, but through the body, through action. And so I decided I would attend the conference, but in attendance to the rock. And that I would, the delegate to the conference would be the rock. And I would be in attendance to the rock. So the rock was on a trolley that I pushed around the whole conference. Also, when I went to the loo, when I went for lunch. And I recently had to write a book chapter on it, which was very challenging. Um, and anyway, to su suffice to say, the chapter's in two parts. One where I talk about the reading of Heidegger and the magnetism of rocks and of having to manoeuvre Heidegger's texts and how they are trying to open up your thinking in a threshold with the non-human. Um, and the second half of the chapter, I ended up writing poetically as a way of documenting the performance. And I'm just going to read, it's in stanzas, um, and I'm just going to read one out, if you'll bear with me, to give you a feeling for that. Um, and I should say that, along with Heidegger, I feel that, you know, he says to philosophize is to inquire into the extraordinary. And I love this combination of the extraordinary that includes what we call the ordinary. Um, I think of ordination I th and he says, you know, we don't just bump into these things. There's a certain kind of activation and work we have to do. It's not our agency per se that activates everything else, but there is something we have to activate or something doesn't happen. Anyway, here's the, here's one of the stanzas and, and this, Liberational manoeuvre was called They Rock. They Rock is a path of wondering to allow something otherwise in on the act of meaning making, to accept that in a deeper locality of this very circumstance, what I, as creature, am at gifted base substance, and what the rock, as rock, is at gifted base substance, is simultaneously interfused and molten like the planet's viscous core. This arousing primordial medium that was not mother made, but earth grafted, is not conceived, but truth trodden by undulations of mind and matter. I unculture and declutter my carnal antenna so that the rock as rock allows my being as passageway. This is not something I know or understand, but somehow a porosity in my wayward thinking that grasps outwards and triggers muscles and is underway. The way is not an illustration of theory. The way is not of a prepositional nature. The wayfinder is trying to avoid the logic of language in how they operate. The logic that blocks out what the rock already existing long before any of us in our histories has to make available via this situation. This mood way is an open questioning, not a cognitive idea, but certainly the result of a decision. I must keep my mouth shut, keep the otherwise molecules safe and sound. In this part of the universe, at this time, and on this day of the calendar year, on this occasion, as this particular human, I am still as stone statue within all the flux of it. I have stepped aside to allow a different movement to occur. 
the way ahead is a right, an activation of a way to be continually arriving here. Enter the rock, followed by I. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely, uh, Hester. Uh, thank you, thank you. I, I think it's a it's it's a good um, moment to 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 ask people. Uh, I, I let me say uh, two things uh, very 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 quickly. Like uh, the first is indeed, as you pointed out, uh, the ordinary, uh, the kind of fact that actually we're constantly surrounded by minerals. Uh, we we tend to ignore them in so many ways. Uh, your rock, in a sense, is nothing special. You, I, I, you, you deliberately want it to be that. It's interesting that Kailua, as I mentioned before, is picking those stones that in, in many ways they're very, very special. They're strange, they're unique. But actually, even those uh, stones um, had been ignored, uh, for, for example, by jewelry makers and others because they had no particular monetary value, many of them. Um, a whole category of them is called dream stones. Which is interesting as as a, as a name, and um, uh, you know the the what what is lies behind them is the capacity to uh, to to motivate imagination. They have a history in other cultures, let's say the Chinese um, tradition and so on. Um, uh, but but uh, it is definitely the case that uh, that minerals can open up our aesthetics. They can open up our imagination, as you show in your practice so very well. Um, you know, people have have gathered in and or, like among and around stones uh, from ancient times. Uh, one of the most characteristic examples is Stonehenge. Obviously, uh, it's a space, a sublime uh, space, um, um, primary, you know, and uh, the sublime being a primary category of aesthetics, um, and um, it's a space also of ritual, obviously. Uh, so. I think uh, there is an experience that is um, uh, often hard to discover anywhere else. And I think that um, because of that responsibility that you were drawing out from Heidegger, I think uh, the stone in, in, in its resistance, in its kind of uh, solidity, uh, recalcitrance and so on, it kind of pushes a little bit back our parametric aesthetics. Right? The fact that we now can do anything in InDesign, we can build anything we want, use any materials, you know, I will make a skyscraper out of cork, for example. You know, there is um, there is something that kind of is pushing back. And, and the experience of that, I think, is very valuable in the 21st century. So I'm leaving it here and uh, inviting anyone to um, to ask questions or make a contribution uh, my bones started to feel differently as i was listening to you bringing up very mundane topics as it were in this illuminating light and the bones uh, my bones is the uh, the hardest thing i have in my body which got me thinking about something uh, very, very precious to me, and I, I wanted to, sh to, to share that. Um, uh, you have brought to our attention small stones, small rocks, small pieces, rather than mountains, right? Um, obviously, mountains do represent same ray minerals. Um, I used to live up on uh, Mount Dandenong. Uh, it's on the fringes of Melbourne for about six years, uh, very difficult years in my life. Very, very difficult years, you know, post PhD uncertainties, marriage falling apart, things like that. <clears throat> and uh, it is, now that I think about, I've never thought about it until your presentation. So I'm really, really thankful for that. And this is, this, this creature is confirming that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there she is. Right, right time. Um, the mountain ch changed and healed me now that because you know, I would go uh, as I do off the track into the bush with goannas and birds or whatever. And I thought it was all about this wild nature, uh, but the dimension of the mountain, of the rock, uh, uh, really escaped me up until now that all of that was actually living a top of this big 
spiritual body, uh, if you like. And I think it's very important uh, in light of the history of philosophy and figures like Friedrich Nietzsche, who spent so much time in the mountains where he experienced his own spiritual transformation on the rock, as you remember. So this is where Nietzsche's Zarathustra emerges as he writes Gay Science in 1982, a work that has changed the history of philosophy. Uh, he there wouldn't be Heidegger without Nietzsche sitting on the rock. Also, Heidegger himself lived up in the mountains in solitude, I guess also, and was influenced by those things. So these things started coming together for me, and I just wanted to share the impression through my bones. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie. Uh, if I may uh, say something about Hester, uh, like I, I, first of all, there is a, a big tradition that thinks of, of the bones as the stones of the body and the stones as the bones of the earth. Uh, a lot of classical thinkers, um, you know, follow that uh, pan paradigm. And, and I don't want to get into, into details, but uh, it, it's actually more than a metaphor. Our bones are minerals. And actually, uh, a lot of, uh, especially exoskeletons of uh, smaller life, um, so um, early, early shells, small shells, when they die kind of by the billion, they are sedimented and they become um, part of the formation of stones. So there is something in that kind of life at some point from single cells, it kind of um, creates a certain alliance, if you like, with the mineral. And by doing so, it enables itself to structure and articulate itself. So kind of life complexifies and articulates itself through this kind of partnering with the inanimate and, and with the mineral in specific. And, um, and, 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 and our bones and our hair and our nails and our teeth, you know, are the kind of very clear manifestations of, of that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And of course, uh, the mountain is, is a whole different, indeed, uh, domain that, that one can go with that. Uh, just let me say very, you know, the, the whole Christianity is, is supposedly based on this guy who's called Simeon otherwise right and 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 Christ says no I will rename you I will call you Peter that is stone because I'm going to found the whole church on you you're like Petros now you're like a stone right so um absolutely the kind of foundational character uh is um of, of stone is there um but Hester if you want to add something to that or if we have other questions just, just one little thing. Um, just thank you so much for saying I felt the change in my bones or however you put it. I just can't think of a better response to the provocations of philosophy or art. Um, so anyway, I love that. Um, I think we underestimate our receptors in our body and I think the fact that our bones and our teeth are minerals, you know, they're doing something, you know, they're receiving probably more profoundly than our brains and our culture. Um, I just wanted to inverse what you said and remind us of caves. So we have mountains, but then also we have caves. And I'm thinking of prehistoric man and woman and our origins and of Nancy's really amazing essay, um, the, the image in the grotto or the painting in the grotto and the evocation of the, of the hand touching the rock. To also, we talk, Georges, you talk about life collaborating with the mineral and the inorganic and it's essential. And then I, I think of a different it's layer, much, much later or more, uh, human-sized phenomenological for want of a better description where a human creature touches rock and very early on in what could be called our cultural our imaginative development it's that threshold of a touch of the rock that opens up these possibilities of thinking that are both highly abstract but that put us in touch with a, a, the cosmos 
which is a is an actual actual an actual actual do we have any uh final words on our part um, i have a final to... final uh apocalyptic eschatological words if you don't mind see only because hester mentioned the cave right so if our uh, one of our forefathers plato is right to a degree about the allegory of the cave right about the light and the prison in the cave in which we live something that i've been wondering about this whole year because of all these wars in particular in the last couple of weeks it remains unclear whether this cave is located in the mountain or in the mountain that is a volcano that's a, a very interesting question indeed <clears throat> i can only say that to that that <clears throat> Plato has been criticized by someone, let's say, like Michel Serre, of course, others as well, uh, in, in that cave uh, story, because, uh, you know, the, the, the cave there is a place of darkness and a place where you actually, that, that, that you actually want to escape. And Michel Serre uses um, 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 a passage from um, um, uh, To the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne's. Um, in which he describes uh, the unspeakable, really, beauty of a cave that they chance upon uh, with uh, a profusion of minerals, actually, that create the most kind of gleaming and, 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 and splendid experience that you can uh, possibly imagine. So, uh, you know, in Verne, you have this cave, which is the exact opposite. You know, it's a place of... Of, of of epiphany of of showing rather than a place of hiding and obscuring which is uh the function of the case cave in uh um we're definitely terrestrial creatures like it only takes us kind of going down a hundred meters which if we walked would be nothing if we go down down a hundred meters even 20 meters we like feel completely out of this world uh there is definitely uh it's one of the things that actually still science is trying to understand. Like we have very little knowledge of, relatively speaking, of, of the subterranean. Um, but yes, and just to address uh, Christine's uh, comment, uh, yes, it's definitely not a European prerogative or anything. I think humanity uh, across the world has... Uh, had that relation to stones. I mean, let's think of, for example, uh, the whole um, Islamic religion. Uh, Hasser, we've been talking about that. I, this is a meteor. It's a stone falling from the sky. And you kind of articulate, just like the Petros in the Christian religion, like you articulate the whole experience of, of, of pilgrimage around that stone. Uh, yeah. But... Um, so thank you all so very much. And uh, I hope the rest of the day goes very well. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you.